which is our topic for the next three weeks. We're talking food this week, next week pollution, and the week after that we're doing noise. We want to kick it right off with Deborah Giles, who is one of the preeminent researchers for the Southern Resident Killer Whales. Giles, um, you've been intimately acquainted with why food is such an issue for these whales. Obviously, they um, rely on Chinook salmon. Chinook salmon stocks are not doing so well. So maybe you could start us off by telling us what happens to the whales when they don't have enough to eat and uh, how does that affect um, their survival? Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here and with these amazing um, other panelists. Um, this is a conversation that's absolutely needed to happen for a long time. The southern residents are um, declining uh, we listed them in 2005 in the United States um, with 88 individual animals. We now have 75, so we're absolutely going the wrong way. And um, although there are a number of identified threats to this population of animals, um, by far the lack of prey is the biggest issue. Um, they are struggling to uh, have babies and have the babies be born alive and, um, and thrive. Um, so our research, so I'm a, I'm a field biologist with the Center for um, Conservation Biology, which is a program of the University of Washington, and we utilize a scat detection dog on the front of our boat. This is a program of Sam Wasser, um, and this dog is amazing. He allows us to collect fecal samples non-invasively, and through that analysis, we have found that 70% of pregnancies are lost before the calf is born viable. Um, in K-Pod alone, we've, we haven't had a living baby since 2011. Um, <clears throat> the research, the fecal analysis shows that these females are highly stressed uh, nutritionally. And when they're stressed nutritionally, they um, spontaneously miscarriage their babies. And so um, we have this really amazing kind of un unintended experiment where we have uh, mammal eating killer whales occurring in the same water, sometime at the same time, uh, and those, those animals are, are thriving. There's lots and lots of babies being born. I just learned from a colleague, um, Jared Towers in Canada, that there are more, uh, more killer whale calves born in the last 10 years to the transients that occur in our waters than there are in the totality of the southern resident clan. So um, everything really points back to food, and so we need to do everything in our power to get more, more food uh, in the water for those whales to find. So the point you're making is that if we can get them enough food, then these other issues that like we're going to be focusing on the next couple of weeks reduce their impact essentially because they have enough to eat, so they're not as stressed out, and, yeah. and we can deal with the other stuff. That this is the most immediate need. Absolutely. So when we talk about uh, salmon recovery, there are a lot of different angles we're going to touch on tonight, and we're going to even touch on even next week related to pollution, but we want to start with habitat because I've learned over the last uh, year or so that habitat is a real problem. Um, Dave Herrera, we're going to start with you because uh, I, I, and I want you to introduce yourself, but before that I want to tell people that, um, you know, we've spent a lot of money on salmon habitat, right? And we still are at this point in history where we're saying we don't have enough. So a lot of people wonder, um, is it working and why not? What do we need to do so that we see something different with this next billion dollars that Governor Inslee is gonna put into this? Uh, thank you and my name's Dave Herrera. I'm a member of the Skokomish Indian tribe, you know, also on the governor's um, SRKW task force. And one of the issues that the uh, tribes in that uh, process have been raising is the lack of protection of habitat. As you said, Allison, we've spent over a billion dollars in habitat restoration. Uh, tribes have reduced their fisheries over the last 15 years by as much as 90%. And uh, still over that time frame, the Chinook populations, which the orcas depend on, continues to decline. Um, the one element that we haven't had any success with is the protection of habitat that produces the Chinook salmon. Um, over that si same time period, uh, the habitat um, destruction has outpaced the restoration of habitat and uh, it's because we don't have enough um, uh, good enough land use regulations and development regulations to truly protect that habitat. And that's a part of the conversation that we haven't been successful yet in, in having and getting out there to people. 
So what's the problem then when it comes to having that conversation? Anybody want to take that one? I mean, if you're saying that, you know, we're, we haven't gotten to that point yet. Who, David, would you like to talk about that? Uh, I, I can do that a little bit, and then and Jay would have some, okay. uh, some to add as well. Um, so I'm David Trout, Natural Resources Director for the Nisqually Tribe, and I was hired a long time ago, 32 years ago, by Billy Frank to work on protecting the Nisqually watershed and making sure that fish had cold, clean water and a home to come home to when they return from the ocean. Um, I mean, there's a couple of challenges. One is that for us to protect habitat means people need to do something different on the landscape and getting them to think about how they relate to the landscape um, differently than they do now is a challenge. People want to live along the waters. I have a beautiful view of Puget Sound from my house. I really enjoy. I probably shouldn't be that close to Puget Sound and I recognize that, but we're all there. And, and on our drive up today to this, uh, to this opportunity, the traffic and the amount of people in Seattle area and the Puget Sound area, you, you see it, you experience it. The growth is coming. More people are moving into Puget Sound and they want to live along the waterways and along Puget Sound and see those things. And if we don't change fundamentally how we relate to the landscape and how we relate to the waters, we're not going to be successful in protecting this critical habitat for fish. And it's a real key component is being able to make a difference on the landscape. The next two million people that come in need to be very different from the last two million that came in. Yeah, and to go over to Jay, um, you know, it's interesting that you brought that up, David, because today somebody commented on one of my Facebook videos that we just have too many people and we should just give up. <laughs> We're just, you know, we have all these people coming in, moving into Seattle, into the Puget Sound area that just forget it. Like, there's just nothing we can do. We're going to outpace ourselves. What do you say when you hear people say, like, what's the point? Um, <clears throat> we're not going to give up. Uh, I'm Jay Manning. I'm with the Puget Sound Partnership. And first thing I want to do is thank King 5 and you for this coverage of the ORCA issue. It's really fantastic and we need it. Um, it's a challenge for sure with this kind of growth and it is testing the limits of our system. There are really two components when you think about habitat. There's protecting what we have and restoring what we've lost. And it's politically easy to spend money on restoring what we've lost. Nobody objects to that. What's really hard politically is protecting what we have because that requires a city or a county or the state to tell somebody, no, you can't build that deck, that dock, that house. You can't do it, you can't do it at all or you can't do it the way you want to do it. You have to be further back, a bigger setback. That's politically hard. That is extremely difficult and, and we're not good at it. N not any level of government is good at it. We have to get better at protecting what we have. We have to improve our land use codes, we have to improve our local ordinances, but we really need, it doesn't make sense to spend a billion more dollars restoring habitat if we're not gonna protect what we have first. Mm -hmm. So uh, anybody else wanna talk habitat while we have a chance? Um, yeah, so yeah. Uh, my name is Brian Fleming and I'm uh, a data analytics and uh, an editor at a local blog, uh, Tidal Exchange, about fisheries issues. and. You know, I think for me, the thing that, uh, if I could communicate anything, it's, you know, we've talked a lot about the legit issue that habitat is. The critical thing for people to understand is that um, unlike a, a recovery of birds or marine mammals that we're used to, where protecting the adult population is kind of the path to recovery, um, for salmon, you know, a, as every fourth grader learns in school, you know, all the adult salmon that return to the river are gonna die. And so the only path to survival is for those fry uh, and smolts to emerge and be healthy. And so the habitat is the limiting factor in the, in the vast majority of the waterways that we're dealing with. And so that's why it's so vitally important because every year the entire population has to turn over. And if they aren't able to survive in the rivers, if there aren't sufficient places for those returning salmon to nest and, 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 raid, and for those young salmon to, to live, then the populations decline. And so that's why it's so vital. All the things that the, the gentleman who spoke before me, they're absolutely right that it's essential that this early life cycle from the headwaters out to the estuaries is the, is the limiting factor in all of our fisheries. I do want to say we are taking your questions and comments, so I wanted to check in real fast. Do we have any yet? Yeah. Okay, so Elizabeth with our digital team is going to read a question. What do you got? Yeah, so there are quite a few questions about how tribe fishing with nets is affecting the habitat, so I, I can't give it to just one person because there are many people asking. So I do hear that a lot, so <laughs> would you like to take that? Sure. Okay, Dave. Um, it's important to understand that nets are a gear type, mm -hmm. just like a hook and line is a gear type or a beach seine is a gear type. 
they're all just tools used to catch fish. So there's nothing inherently bad about any one gear over another gear. Um, we have the knowledge and ability to know when to use what gears at what times, including gill nets. And so we have um, learned over the years how to manage those fisheries so they are not overly impacting the fish that uh, we're trying to protect. Steve, would you like to talk about this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm probably in the minority here. I'm uh, <coughs> because I want to talk about the the whole harvest problem. Uh, <coughs> this is one of the H that seems to be uh, <coughs> forgotten uh, sometimes. And Steve, yeah, I'm going to introduce myself. Okay. I'm Steve Matthews. Thank you. Just making I'm sure. I'm retired, <laughs> f uh, professor of fishery management from the University of Washington. I've also spent a good share of my life uh, gillnetting, uh, trolling from Washington to Alaska, and I've been a sport fisherman since I was about five years old on Puget Sound. <coughs> We're killing too many Chinook salmon in fisheries, and so many of these are undersized fish below the size limit that are eye-hooked, gill-hooked, and die, and so many of these are incidental mortalities in various nets, uh, not only salmon nets, but trawl nets, uh, herring, uh, you name it, shrimp nets too up and down the coast. I'm gonna give you some numbers. <coughs> the incidental mortality on Chinook salmon exceeds the catch, the landed catch up and down the coast by another 50%. Most of these are little fish two, three, four, five pounders. They get thrown back and die. Those little fish would grow to be 20 pounders. If you take the loss in numbers of 50% and you see that those could be much bigger fish <coughs> if they've been allowed to grow, we're losing half the potential, the potential production of our Chinook salmon stocks, and we've been doing it for 100 years. We've been fishing dead wrong in so many ways. The size limit thing, these year-round fisheries, these, um, uh, <coughs> these bycatch fi uh, figures that are swept under the rug without good reporting, without uh, uh, good coverage uh, in the fisheries themselves. It's a tremendous problem. We can Shoot sea lions, I guess, but who's gonna let us do that? We can blow dams, but there hasn't been a hydro dam built on the Columbia River in seven, in, in, since 1970, and yet this is the period in which Chinook salmon have declined. We can get more production immediately for us and the orcas, immediately by correcting a myriad of bad harvest management problems. I can give a long list of things we should do. I've given this list to the Department of Fisheries. I've testified twice to the Fish and Wildlife Commission, and I'm gonna be speaking on this <laughs> issue at the University of Washington shortly in a lecture. We're killing too many small fish. Steve, can you pass it to Jay? Because I think he wants to respond. Thanks, thank yeah. you for your comment. Thank you for that comment, Steve. But I, I think it's a mistake. I, I agree with you that harvest needs to be on the table and a, a part of the discussion. My understanding is whether you're talking tribal fisheries, commercial or recreational, they, all three sectors have been reduced dramatically in every part of Puget Sound. In some cases up to 90%. In some cases fisheries have stopped altogether. And I'm not saying that harvest should be off the table, but I'm saying this is a dangerous argument for those of us who care about salmon and orca recovery. We should be talking about growing the number of fish, not arguing over who gets to take the very last one. Anybody else? And if I could add to that, um, the question was in particular around impacts of tribal fishing. And uh, not all fishing is the same, and not all fisheries management is the same. And the tribes, for the most part, in particular the two tribes that you have here, the Nisqually tribe and the Skokomish tribe, fish in the rivers for adult salmon that are coming back. 
and so there aren't juvenile issues, there aren't size limit issues. We know what we catch, we know which stock we're catching. We manage very carefully to make sure the stock is sustainable and that additional returns can occur over time. The limiting factor for Nisqually, and, and I would suggest perhaps the Skokomish as well, isn't the fisheries impacts on the fish, but it's the habitat that's supporting those fish and reproducing those fish over time. Allison, in your story on the Skagit, you made one of my favorite analogies about how habitat's kind of like a hotel. Mm -hmm. And there are a certain number of rooms in these hotels available. And for the most part, in our rivers, in our, in our estuaries, there's no vacancies. The hotels are full. Yeah. And so we can only produce so many fish. And we're managing carefully our harvest in those rivers to make sure we don't exceed the numbers necessary to continue the runs. But the key is we need to build more hotels, not real hotels, but estuary hotels and, and habitat space to produce more fish. The point that Jay was getting at, we need to produce more fish. The fisheries management issues that uh, Professor Matthews, I still call him Professor Matthews, he was on my <laughs> advisory committee when I was in master's. Was he that work. passionate back then? Yes, he was, okay. very much so. He was hard on me, let me tell you, he was hard on me. I can't see that about him. <laughs> um, <laughs> the incidental take in distant trawl fisheries off the coast is a challenge and it's a problem and it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a management complication that we need to get a better handle on. No question about that. But I wanna make sure that as we talk about fisheries management, we understand where, our, it, where it's working well, and where we've got it under control and where there's places where we need to do a better job. And certainly these incidental catches and distant fisheries or something we could do a better better job of. I do want to say real fast that the hotel room analogy is uh, belongs to Corey Green, who is a federal scientist with NOAA. He, Just so I don't take any, I don't. Yeah, we take. <laughs> <laughs> he's over you. If you're listening. He you're probably is watching. <laughs> so, Jacques, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm Jacques White. Uh, I'm the executive director of Long Live the Kings, and it's a nonprofit organization focused on wild salmon recovery and supporting sustainable fishing in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I have I have an analogy about this as well. So we we've just heard that um, fisheries, at least in Puget Sound, over the last 20, 30, 40 years have been cut back by 70 to 90 percent. Um, we haven't seen, and then earlier we were talking about habitat protection. So we haven't seen a similar sacrifice, if you will, on the part of folks who use habitat, develop habitat on a daily basis, and all of us do it. Every time we flush the toilet or clean the toilet, we put something in the water that's gonna hurt the, hurt, uh, the water and hurt the fish. Uh, every time we drive to work, drive to school, drive to church, drive to recreate, we're, we're putting stuff in the environment that isn't, isn't good for fish. Um, if we were to take a similar approach to land management that we did to harvest, um, when you go to develop a lot, uh, we would say, you're, you want to build a house of this size, we're going to let you build a house that's 25% of that size. So think about that, what, that, what kind of impact that would have. And, and if you take, take that from the side of the folks that are fishing, how that feels, you're, you're, you're severely limiting your opportunities for a living, for your culture, uh, for your way of life. Uh, similarly, if, if we're not funding restoration adequately, so let's say you're gonna build a house and we're gonna say, you have this budget and you know this is what you need to build even that 25%, uh, of the house that you wanted to build, well, we're gonna give you 25% of that and expect you to get your house done. So we have some severe challenges and, and looking at fisheries to recover all of the elements that we have to recover in salmon recovery is not gonna be particularly helpful. There are things we can do better. Uh, clearly some of the offshore fishing practices, as David said, and as Steve said, are a challenge, but there's a lot more that we have to do for salmon recovery. Uh, Brian, I know you also talk fish, right fishing, so would you like to weigh in on this? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, again, we talked about the, the necessary part of the cycle is so different here. And I just think, you know, everything you're hearing is sort of reiterating, if we aren't successful at restoring the habitat, the numbers cannot grow. You will have more fish come back, they will lay eggs, and those eggs will not survive, you know, the egg to migrant transition. They will not be able to do it. So it is vital if we see a path forward to producing more salmon in our local rivers, that path is squarely through the process of rebuilding the places for those salmon to reproduce. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions, Elizabeth? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, everybody ought to forgive me on name pronunciations, but Ariel asks, how do we get Eastern Washington to appreciate the issues with the killer whales since we know more about it here on the western side of the state. I'm kind of wondering if that's maybe pointed towards the Snake River dams, do you think? Maybe, could I repeat the question? So I the, the question? <laughs> yeah, how, how do we get Eastern Washington residents to appreciate the, the uh, concerns that are happening over here that Western Washington knows well? 
Okay, well, first off, you have to understand the role of dams in eastern Washington, specifically the lower Snake River dams. There are four dams, I, I didn't say who I was. That's okay. I'm Jim Waddell, I'm retired from the Army Corps of Engineers, 35 years, Deputy District Engineer in Walla Walla, and I've spent about 10,000 hours with an informal group called Dam Sense studying the dam, uh, these lower Snake dams. Anyway, those four dams are in eastern Washington and they're the point of controversy over there. And I think what the most important thing in eastern Washington it's glossed over is the fact that there's an economic um, um, loss by keeping those dams and a lot of economic gain to be had if the dams are breached. If those dams are, are breached and um, that results in about three or 4,000 more jobs in the six counties along the Lower Snake River, and those are agricultural jobs from reclaimed agricultural lands, primarily viticulture and orchards, and also recreation and fishing. And so I, I think that's the part that's glossed over. And the loss of jobs is very minimal because it's mostly the federal employees on the dams, a couple hundred of them. Uh, farmers are not impacted that greatly because the irrigation farmers, that can be fixed for about $20 million. And shipping of grain on the Lower Snake River has already most largely shifted to rail, and the rest of it can easily shift to rail at no increase in cost. So that, that's a misplaced um, sort of um, myth that Eastern Washington is gonna be a loser here if these dams are breached when in fact they, they're gonna be winners on this. Um, there's a lot to, uh, more about the connection though. I think the problem with, uh, that's misunderstood here is what is the role of the Snake River dams in, in the southern resident killer whales? And I think part of the problem is the idea that the southern residents actually spend about half of their time historically evolved this way to eat Chinook out in the coastal areas from the Columbian Snake River. And uh, NOAA estimates that 50% came from those two, the Columbian snake, and about 25 of that was snake. So the, the connection here is, is that Chinook coming down the Snake River dams, um, we lose about um, 8 million Chinook smolts a year. In fact, that's going on right now. Those smolts are dying um, because of the dams and reservoirs. And so those, those, those smolts are the, the best and fastest source of Chinook recovery in terms of getting more fish out into the ocean for both fisheries and for uh, southern resident killer whales. And with the decline in the Salish Sea and the Fraser River of Chinook stocks in general, the southern residents are now spending more time. In fact, uh, they only spent 47 days in the Salish Sea in, in 2017, and the rest of the time they were out in the open ocean and, uh, and a lot of time at the mouth of the Columbia River intercepting spring and summer Chinook, their primary historical source, but now even fall Chinook. And so that's, that's the, the real connection between eastern Washington and the fish and the economics of why the Snake River dams are so important to the economy if they're, if they're breached. Uh, that's the point. Uh, Giles, I would like to go back to you if it's okay. Um, you can touch on the Snake River dams if you'd like to, but just to bring you back into the conversation about the fish, you've been involved in some discussions about how to recover salmon as it relates to the whales. Why don't you weigh in on this if you don't mind? Well, I personally think that the Snake River dams uh, should be breached uh, in order to recover that river and give um, ancient, ancient bloodlines of salmon access to their uh, natal rivers. Um, it's cold water, high elevation habitat above the dams, and I think that it can just do, uh, it, can, it can do good. I mean, I, good for the salmon overall. Um, I think that personally, my recent crusade in the last four years has been about trying to have the southern residents recognized as a major stakeholder in the fisheries management decisions that we make. Um, and that's from Southeast Alaska all the way to Monterey. Um, the whales are um, kind of factored into this uh, natural mortality or ocean conditions uh, figure when we're coming up with fisheries quotas and um, that's not good enough. Clearly that's not good enough for the whales. Um, they were the original harvesters of these salmon. Um, they're a tribe of, of beings that, uh, that deserve to, to have a, a, a quota. Um, we can't keep doing business as we have been and expect to, re to uh, uh, recover this population. Um, and I think all of these things matter. All of these small things that we're doing um, are, are going to make a difference. Uh, restoring local habitats, restoring estuaries. I think it's vitally important to, to recognize, as David was saying, um, you know, we have to be mindful of what the ecosystem can support. Um, and uh, to my mind, natural uh, wild Chinook salmon 
um, are vitally important to the ecosystems in which they uh, evolved, and the whales are part of that. Um, I don't know how to rectify that with the fact that we need so much salmon for so many people in so many regions, but um, I think that recognizing the southern residents as a major stakeholder and as, uh, again, a tribe of, of individuals that, that we're spending a lot of time and money trying to recover, if we don't start recognizing them as a major stakeholder, we're missing, we're missing the target, we're missing our, our um, ability to do that. Would anyone else want to weigh in? Yeah. I, I want to go back to the Eastern Washington question mm -hmm. and and um, challenge the premise that the folks in Eastern Washington don't care about orca or about salmon. I've had the great privilege of serving on the Salmon Recovery Funding Board for 12 years and it's, as its chair for the last four. And working with the communities over there doing salmon recovery, they are engaged and energized and maybe per capita more involved there than they are in Western Washington. The work they were getting done in the Klickitat and in the Snake and in the Upper Columbia and the stuff that's being fought about for above Chief Joe is pretty amazing and aggressive stuff and supported by communities and by landowners there and, and being supported by conservation districts and by farmers and, and willing cooperators coming to the table to do some pretty amazing things. So I think that it's not fair to say that the folks East aren't necessarily supportive. I think they, they have also have other values that they're trying to balance um, that are different from those in Western Washington, but they're definitely part of the solution and need to be a part of the solution. Does anyone else want to talk about the yeah. dams? Yeah, well, I, 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 what I would suggest is we, we here on the west side of the state, we have plenty of dams to focus on other than the lower Snake River dams. We have dams probably on the order of 20 to 30 dams in the Puget Sound that either completely block passage and you could fix it by putting in upstream and downstream passage for salmon, or they could come out altogether. There's a dam on the North Fork of the Nooksack that is targeted to come out. It should come out. There's a dam on the Upper Puyallup that should come out. There, there are, we want hotel space in Puget Sound. Let's take those dams out or put in passage. They don't all have to come out. There's a Corps of Engineers dam on the, on the green that has no passage and has not had passage since, it's, since it was built, they're in the process of putting together a plan to put in upstream and downstream passage that'll open up 100 miles of new habitat, lots of hotel rooms. So I, the Snake River dams are a very challenging topic, very politically difficult, and I think there are much easier targets right here in Puget Sound that we should be focused on. As for the Nooksack, thank you for teasing for my story on Friday. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing, that dam. Would you like to respond, Jim? Well, yeah, I, I think there's um, uh, the Snake River dams, uh, two points. Uh, yes, uh, there is a lot of uh, salmon recovery efforts going on in eastern Washington. Unfortunately, what's been done on the dams themselves, on the lower Snake River dams, has been a billion dollar waste of taxpayers and now ratepayer money. That, that billion dollar investment got us nothing in improved returns through those dams and reservoirs. Now, um, in terms of the, the belief that this is a long-term, hard-to-do, impossible situation breaching the dams, that's where I think that, that my experience in the Corps of Engineers comes in here because the, the policy issues involving these dams is really straightforward. These dams can be placed into a non-operational status um, by a commander, and we would expect a three-star or two-star general to, that could do that very easily. The other thing is that breaching of these dams because they're just removing an earthen berm is a matter of a three or four month process. And so in the appropriations, there aren't any federal appropriations. This is all paid by Bonneville Power Administration, which is ratepayer money. So all the economics support immediate dam breaching, and I think this is the critical thing. While I agree with all the dams and all this other stuff going on in Puget Sound, you can't solve an immediate crisis for southern resident killer whales in terms of Chinook prey any faster than, snot, than stop killing eight million smolts that are being killed right now. And breaching, you can start this year and save about two to four million of them, depending on whether you breach one or two dams this winter. So, and politically, it's, it's, I don't know why it's been politicized, but yeah, it has. But both parties talk about keeping the dams, but, on the, but the bottom line is the, the evidence, the core, the, uh, the feasibility study, the environmental impact statement is there. This is the dam breaching appendix of the EIS. It, it's operative right now for those dams. Everything is in place, but the will of the Northwest delegation or the tribes to ask the governor or the Corps of Engineers to do this. Thank you. Um, do we have a question? Can we? Plenty of questions. Yes. Mike Arizona asks, what would be the impact if humans were not allowed to harvest any salmon for a period of time? 
would a moratorium on human consumption have an impact until some of the underlying issues of pollution and habitat are addressed? Well, that takes us back to fishing. I, I want to make sure, we'll go to that, but I want to make sure we do have time. So just so we have a check on time, we have a 30 minutes left to get to our other topics of predators. And um, so Steve, would you like to just answer that? I mean, I kind of know what you're going to say, but <laughs> so, so with a moratorium yeah. on fishing, what do you think? Uh, I don't think we have to go, go quite that far. Uh, there's so much cleanup that we can do in our fishing uh, that, that would get us a long way towards uh, a whole lot more fish. I'd like to, uh, Correct the misconsumption, uh, m m uh, uh, misstatement. misstatement or something. I, I probably wasn't uh, understood very well. <coughs> I'm not talking about, you know, I probably sound like a, uh, like a recovering drunk at a revival. No. I, I've, uh, <laughs> I've killed so damn many little fish and nets and, and hooks and things uh, uh, <laughs> that could be saved if we just had a, a, a good look see at our regulation. This is up and down the coast. This is the nip not just in the state. And uh, so I'm not talking about less fish out there. I'm talking about putting more fish out there by cleaning up our dirty fishing, by cleaning up the wastage. You could use uh, just a couple of examples from my trolling and my operating of a, of a fishing resort when I was a kid at Hope Island, just big spoons and plugs. You just catch big kings, you don't catch the little ones. Uh, nets. There's unlimited depth nets in Puget Sound, chains and, tr and uh, gill nets, and I, that's tribal and non-tribal. You can catch the chums, the pinks, the sockeyes perfectly well. Those swim on the surface with much shallower nets, about a third of what we have right now. The Chinook are down in the water column. You'd save about 80% of the little ones you're catching right now without any serious effect on the ability to catch the other fish. Uh, that, that's what goes on in Southeast Alaska. Shallow nets are huge. Guys make money on them. You do the same thing here. You wouldn't have all that excess web in the water to kill the little Chinook and kill the uh, bottom fish and, and the eelgrass and you name it. So it, I, I think it's a fair question to, um, to talk about because it is a question I get a lot. Should I not eat salmon anymore? And in fact, I got a press release today from a co-op in uh, Mount Vernon that's not gonna sell Chinook anymore. So, um, you know, maybe we could just stay on this for a second. If you have, you're a consumer, should you just not eat salmon anymore? What do you think? So I think uh, to get back to the specific question, which is should we stop, should we think about stopping fishing? Yeah. And I think, you know, my opinion and certainly discussed among others is that the net effect of stopping fishing, I think actually hurts the southern residents. And I think what happens is that, um, yes, you would, there's clearly a, a market impact from, from that. But again, if the hotel spaces aren't built, you'll have extra returners that'll get through and you won't see an increase in fish. But what you will see is the department as, a, as, as you stop all the fisheries, of course, all the license revenue that supports the department will go away. And that license revenue is doing restoration projects, building hotel rooms. It's also running the hatcheries that are also producing Chinook for the orcas. So I think the unintended consequence of putting a moratorium on fisheries would actually be negative on the southern residents. Anyone else, Steve, do you have any, anyone want to say something? Um, just with respect to a moratorium, on fishing, um, you know, when you hear that, nobody's talking about a moratorium on building, on developing, on um, the, these other things that are, you know, destroying salmon. Nobody's talking about stopping any of those things. They're just talking about stopping fishing. So that only becomes a band-aid because all those other activities will continue and that'll lead to the continued decline. And if I could add, we, we've in essence seen moratoriums on fishing in a lot of our rivers. You know, and it's still a Guamish. They haven't had a commercial Chinook fishery in 30 years. And yet during the North of Falcon process this year, we fought to get them 15 fish for ceremonial purposes. The runs are not recovering in the absence of fishing. And I think Brian's point is a really good one. And there's a lot of points connected to that, that if we remove people from the equation, we remove the caring and concern and ability to do something different. And so keeping people connected to salmon through fishing in a sustainable way is ultimately what's gonna save the fish in the long run.
You know, I think this is maybe a good transition to predators because um, the paper that has become known as the Chasco paper, right, uh, told us that um, that seals and sea lions, pinnipeds, are essentially eating twice it Chinook salmon of the southern resident killer whales and six times, right, of the commercial um, and recreational fishermen. So I'm curious, uh, any of you that would like to weigh in, where do you stand on this debate over having a cull, like a legal hunt or killing of seals and sea lions to uh, save the Chinook? So um, I, I can take that at least to start. Um, so all, all we've been talking about in terms of habitat and water quality and potential fishing impacts um, are, are what we classically think are, are problems for salmon. But what we've learned over the last five or six years by looking at what's happening to the salmon out in Puget Sound or on the shorelines as they leave their native rivers is that for Chinook salmon, for example, have about 50% of the marine survival now that they had back in the mid-1980s. So something changed in Puget Sound that has affected those fish. And it's happened for coho salmon, and it's happened to our steelhead. In fact, steelhead are surviving at about 10% of the rate that they used to survive in the marine environment. And we think most of that mortality is occurring between the river mouth and the Strait of Juan de Fuca or the Strait of Georgia. So this is a serious problem. And if we want to recover salmon to the point where we want uh, to have adequate salmon to support fisheries, adequate salmon, uh, in Puget Sound and the Salish Sea, including the Strait of Georgia, to support our southern resident killer whales, we're gonna have to look at this marine survival and fix it. Predation is a part of that factor. For Chinook, there's probably three, three or four critical factors that are affecting their marine survival. One is uh, predation, largely by harbor seals, as the Chasco paper uh, demonstrates. Two, it's loss of estuarine habitat or places where we don't have adequate estuarine habitat to support the productivity in the freshwater as our fish come out. And that's worse in places like uh, the Puyallup River, the Duwamish River right outside the studio here, uh, the Cedar River, maybe the even the Snohomish River, compared to the Skagit or the Nisqually where we have more healthy estuaries. Um, Third, uh, we have a problem with adequate food resources once the fish get out into the environment. There aren't enough herring uh, anymore for the juvenile salmon, and that has a double benefit, because when you have adequate herring or other forage fish populations in Puget Sound, then you have enough food for seals, and they'll eat those energy-rich forage fish instead of juvenile salmon if we have those available. Um, we, in some unique areas, we have problems, for example, with flame retardants in the lower river in the Snohomish, where juvenile Chinook are picking up uh, co contamination at levels that are causing them not to survive as well. So predation is part of the, f part of the story. Um, culling seals in some particular instances may be the only way to address that. We have a very large seal population. It's three to five times what it was uh, 40 years ago here. It's 10 times larger in the Strait of Georgia. So they have 100,000 seals now uh, in the Strait of Georgia and BC. Um, those, those large populations are having an impact on our salmon. But uh, we also, as I think uh, Dr. Giles talked about, we have increasing populations of transient killer whales. We should track that carefully and see what the effect of those is gonna be on the seal populations. Maybe they can take care of that, at least in some places. Um, again, increasing forage fish populations, double benefit. Mm -hmm. Restore shoreline habitat, uh, increase the ability of herring and sand lance and other forage fish species to spawn. Um, and, and I think uh, lastly, in places like Hood Canal where we have a barrier to migration for juvenile fish, if we can figure out how to address that and reduce the predation at those spe specific sites, um, we can affect predation. So there's a multiple ecosystem approach that we recommend for addressing predators. And if I could give you an example, and you might remember this, I think it might have been the first story you did here after moving from Florida on the Nisqually mm -hmm. about acoustic tagging of our steelhead, mm -hmm. we were inserting small tags into our steelhead and tracking their migration through Puget mm -hmm. Sound. And we noticed a couple of things. One is that they don't spend a lot of time in Puget Sound. They're moving through in 13 days, they go from the Nisqually to Port Angeles. So they're cruising through Puget Sound. But we've also noticed is that uh, in most years, the survival to Port Angeles in that 13 days is like 8% of our steelhead make it. So 92% are dying before they get to Port Angeles. We've had a couple of years where we've had the transients come down and give us a police escort and escort our steelhead through the narrows and up into out of Puget Sound. <laughs> and our survival went from 8% to 40%. Mm. So it clearly is pointing at predation for our steelhead as being a real problem for us. It's something that needs to be solved. The question though is if you get rid of, uh, you know, you have this call, then you do you lose the transients, they don't come in as often, and right. then you lose that escort you're talking about. Right. 
you have something to say, Jim? Uh, yeah, well, once again, since uh, a large part of the Chinook prey comes from the Snake and Columbia River, let's talk about predation there. There's two kinds, basically. That's the seals and, heart and um, so forth. All right, Bonneville Dam. Now, um, there's been a lot of talk about what those numbers are, but uh, core reports indicate that it's a smaller uh, proportion than people have been led to believe. Um, they've observed these, uh, the actual, uh, what these uh, seals have been eating in the Chinook is about 20 something percent of the total take that these seals are, are eating of other fish. The other kind of predation that's more damaging by far on the Snake River and the Columbia River, of course, is the predation of the juveniles in the reservoirs themselves. And this is really the biggest problem. Um, you know, I mentioned eight million smolts die. Well, half of those, more than half, are eaten by predators, smallmouth bass, pike minnows, walleyes, and that kind of stuff. They're invasive species on those rivers. And th that is just a huge um, problem that no one, you can't do anything about that. They, you've tried to, bounty fishing won't take care of it. And so the only way to solve that problem is to remove the reservoir, drain the reservoir, and, that, and that's what breaching does for you. And that's why it's so important to breach these dams quickly. Within a matter of months now, given the criticality of the southern residents that they pointed out, is that go for immediate breaching right now because that's gonna prevent the death um, from predation and going through the dams of eight million smolts. And you know, I wouldn't be sitting here asking this too if the economics didn't support this. And the hydropower issues is, is overblown. The, there's 17% surplus hydropower in the Pacific Northwest. As I, we speak, 8,000 megawatts of surplus power is going to California as we sit here. The Snake River dams are 3% of that uh, surplus and we're losing money on that surplus sales. The lower Snake dams lost 40 million last year. So why on earth are we not taking advantage of what is low hanging fruit? This is not a hard to do. This is not a long term thing if there's a little bit of political will because the Corps has the authority now to place those dams into a non-operational status for all the things we're talking about here, the predation, the hydropower issues and so forth. Thanks, Jim. Anybody else on, anybody else want to talk about well, predators? Uh, uh, <coughs> small comment. Um, I certainly appreciate the, uh, the people who don't fish or even eat fish, but who do respect the, uh, the, the overall ecosystem and the wildlife and the marine mammals and so forth. And there's a lot of those folks out there and their objections are perfectly valid. I'll just make this point. We got a much better argument if we ever get to the point of culling uh, at any great degree, we have a much better argument to do it if we clean up our own fishing first. And I can't stress it enough, there's plenty of dirty fishing going on out there. Anyone else on predators? Well, yeah, okay. Um, so, so just w one way for folks to get a feel for what's going on with marine survival mm -hmm. is that um, uh, there's a, a game out there where we're actually taking some of the tagged fish that David was talking about that have acoustic transmitters in them and tracking them out of Puget Sound and uh, you can actually go online and pick one of those fish that has real data associated with it and track it and see if your fish can make it out of Puget Sound. And it's a way for you to get a real feel for how uh, these fish are, are doing, what are some of the challenges that they face going out, it's called Survive the Sound. Go online to survivethesound.org, pick a fish, uh, form a team, and you can, you can uh, get a first-hand look at exactly what it's like to be a juvenile steelhead migrating out of Hood Canal or out of Puget Sound. But be prepared when yours dies, like mine did. Mine died. Yep. <laughs> mine died too. I had to have a little funeral for it, a digital funeral. Do we have any questions, Elizabeth, that we'd like to share with you? Yeah. <laughs> um, David DeWald asked, I heard the southern resident killer whales travel up and down the coast. If so, are other states taking measures to provide more Chinook? Good question. Who wants to take that? Uh, repeat the question. It was, they travel up and down the coast, so are other states participating in recovery? Yeah. No. <laughs> the answer is yes. The state of Alaska, uh, the last couple of years, shut down their wintertime trolling and sport fishing. They got about a six weeks uh, period up there to go sport fishing. Yet down here, we're still fishing all winter long out here in Pisa Sound. <coughs> Canada has just gone to a, uh, a 10 fish uh, uh, yearly quota for sport fishermen. Here you can catch, uh, I think one or two a day, I can't remember, but uh, every day of the year. So yes, the other states are having problems with our Chinook and they are getting a jump on uh, some of the management problems. Um, Jay, would you like to say anything about that? And then t I'm also curious too for you, Giles, like as you're working with Canada as the whales go up, and if you'd like to say anything about just working with the whales on that standpoint. 
Well, my perspective is that Washington is is light years ahead of the other states in terms of an orca response. Um, it, they're here. They live here. They live in Washington, and that makes sense. I think BC is the next most involved jurisdiction, and they're taking this seriously, but uh, I don't think they've stepped up to it the way that Washington has. Um, I think the fishing restrictions that you talk about, Professor, are driven by factors probably not related to orca. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but um, but I, I, I don't think any of those states are stepping up the way Washington has. And the ORCA task force is, I know this goes beyond a little bit beyond the, the question, but the ORCA task force had four primary recommendations in terms of legislation to, to try to correct the situation for ORCAs. And all four bills have passed. They're on the governor's desk. The legislature has done a good job on the policy side. I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, but there's nothing in there's nothing comparable in BC or Oregon or Alaska that would that would come close to what Washington is doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, one good thing that's happening is that the critical habitat on the outer coast is going to be finally designated. So I think um, whether or not they want to or not, Oregon and Washington down to Point Reyes, California are going to be. Um, kind of brought into the fold and having to look at uh, the killer whales as um, as a factor when looking at development and things like that. I think with regard to fishing, I, I, I guess I kind of just want to go back um, about what we can do in Washington. You know, we have such a rich history of, of fishing here and there's so many um, tribes that have been living here for the millennia. And I would really like to see um, a, a more concerted uh, cooperative effort of trying to create a place-based um, uh, brand, if you will. Um, you know, you, you ask the general consumer, what's the best fish to eat? And they always say Alaskan caught wild salmon. Well, 99% of that salmon is not from Alaska. It's from rivers in BC, Canada, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Um, if we could brand uh, place-based, locally caught salmon, where the whales have had the longest crack at getting them, um, I, I, you know, I might be totally naive, and I'm just learning. I've been saying to everybody that'll listen, like, this is my year of salmon, learning about the the the, the fish and the issues and the politics. But you know, we we are we're a proud state here, and we should um, do whatever we can to try and brand locally caught, sustainably caught salmon uh, within this region and, and make it a thing, make it something that we as a state are proud of. Um, Alice, another state, Oregon actually, um, Rogue River is having historic returns right now and the Rogue is one of the uh, river that they've taken dams out on and that's, the, that's what's causing these massive returns on the Rogue River. So once again, we have to look at this, the, the, the Snake River dams. These are federal dams. And it's, it's, you know, it's amazing that the state of Washington has put enormous effort, a lot of money into this and is willing to spend a lot more. And they're, they're just letting the feds, in this case, the Corps of Engineers and Bonneville, sit on those dams and, and not address the problem there. And if we don't do this, all these investments we're making, particularly in the Columbia Basin, are really not being optimized and, and in, in some cases are being suboptimized to a great degree. We're building habitat in places in Oregon and Idaho that fish can't get to because of the Snake River dams. I mean, a few of them can get there, but the biomass is not there to support that habitat anymore. And so the only solution left is, is, is getting rid of the four snake dams, um, and it has to be done immediately if we want to save the southern residents and the Chinook. If I could come back to the uh, question about what the other states are doing, um, we are light years ahead in terms of salmon recovery and the way we've organized and established um, local communities in charge of bottoms-up approach, the Washington way to salmon recovery. I'm really proud of that. Um, but what Oregon has done that we should take a lesson from is they've got a dedicated funding source for their salmon recovery. They use lottery funds to fund salmon recovery, mm -hmm. and they're not having to go down to the legislature every year, every other year, and try to scramble and fight for money in the face of other kind of needs that don't that we don't compete well against. Um, over the last 12 years that I've been involved at the Salmon Recovery Funding Board, statewide we funded about 15% of the identified need. And, and yet we ask why we're not getting benefits, why we're not seeing salmon return, because we're not spending what's necessary to get the job done. 
that, that's what the ne my next question I was going to ask you is, you know, a lot of these conversations have come out of some criticism over the budget and uh, does it fund enough of the projects that need to be funded? Um, and what can people do if, you know, you have a legislator that is working on voting on through some of this stuff? Um, so can you talk a little bit about the funding issue and, and, yeah. and also just tell people who are watching, like, if they, what they should do if they right. want to get involved? So uh, standard recovery funding is a, is a challenging thing to do because it doesn't rise to the level of schools and jails and people's hearts and minds. So part of this opportunity that you're giving us is to change that perspective in the community and, uh, and we certainly appreciate that. You know, I mentioned that we're funding at 15% of the identified need. It's like our apartment complex is on fire and we're given a garden hose to try to put it out and then people get mad at us when it's still burning and we can't put out the fire. We've never gotten the funds necessary to get the work done. And so, as Dave said, right at the very beginning, we're losing habitat because more people are moving in and they're altering the landscape, and we're not restoring the areas that they've impacted. And so, we're still seeing our populations of salmon and habitat slip away. So, we need to significantly fund in an aggressive way for a long period of time, salmon recovery, we're gonna get there. When we started down this process in 1999 with the state, there were lots of smaller projects that could have significant benefit and they were fairly inexpensive and we've done most of those. Now we're on to the big, complex, expensive, ecosystem changing kind of projects and we're not getting nearly enough funds to do those, that kind of work. For example, the Puget Sound Acquisition and Restoration Account, our major account in Puget Sound for doing these jobs. Right now we're talking about maybe funding one project, maybe funding one and a half projects. We've got 23 on the list that are ready to go. And there are windows of opportunity to open and close with landowners and willing partners. And if the funds aren't there, sometimes these opportunities go away and they never come back. And you've, you've seen that in your work on the Skagit, where if you get a willing landowner that's willing to do something, you better take advantage of that because things change and legacies change. And so we need to, to think about establishing dedicated streams of funds for salmon recovery to get this job done for salmon and for orcas and for all of us that care about fish. And I think Jay wanted to add yeah. on to that. Well, I, Wanna, I wanna talk about the urgency of the situation. And I know you understand this, but I really wanna talk to the viewers that, that this is a crisis situation. These orcas are close to the point of no return. And that is not an exaggeration. That is the situation. And it's the policy of the state of Washington. It's the law of the state of Washington. That we're, we don't allow that. We don't allow species to go extinct and we are in a crisis and it's at times of crisis that the legislature needs to step up and, and we did it with education through the McCleary case, we did it with mental health, um, with Western state issues. It is time now for us to work together to raise money, to develop fund sources that will support salmon recovery and orca recovery in the long run at a level that's adequate to the job, the very large job that's in front of us. And I just, the way that people watching this can affect that is to make their views known to their legislator, to the governor, to their city council people, to their county commissioners, because they all make decisions that have an impact on habitat and on salmon and orca recovery. Um, so now's the time, now is the time. If you care about this issue, it is time for people to get engaged and get involved and be, be part of the solution. Can I? See one. Do we have a question? We do. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let, 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 yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Katie Kirking asks: We've heard a lot about the Columbia Snake System. Can you elaborate on other key rivers for the southern resident killer whale in salmon? Other rivers besides the Snake that are important. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that's. I'm glad that question came up because I, I agree with Jim that the the lower Snake River dams should be should, they should come out. The main reason for that, in my opinion, are salmon runs in Idaho. Salmon can't get up into the clear water and the salmon and that incredible habitat up there, and I think that justifies taking them out. But my, my belief is we should be focused right here in Puget Sound. We have plenty of rivers that are in trouble. The, the Skagit, the, the Nooksack, um, the Puyallup, I mean, really, you name it. None of them are, are in great shape. And some are better than others, some are really hammered, and we have to work on every single one of them. I, I don't, in, in my own mind, I think the Skagit is especially important. I think the, the Nooksack is especially important because of their location. 
and because of their production uh, potential, the Snohomish is really important. Um, but they're all important. And the Squally is a long way away from where the orcas typically hang out. But it's a big producer when it's healthy. And so there, I couldn't say that there's a river that flows into Puget Sound that isn't important. They all are. Um, and we have plenty to do on every one of them. If, 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 and Jay, if I can you know, point something out in terms of funding, breaching the Snake River dams does not cost the state of Washington a dime. And so the, the legislature is sitting there beating our brains out trying to come up with tax money in the state of Washington to solve this problem. It's all good stuff. It's a lot of money though, but for $400 million, you can breach and mitigate everything on the lower Snake River dams. And that, that can be done and paid for by BPA with no increase in rates. In fact, you'll get a credit off old federal treasury debt. That's why it's so, it's the low hanging fruit and the fastest thing you can do. And it's, it's the will of the governor just to call up the Corps of Engineers to say something. We have a few minutes left, so I wanna to try to get a couple more questions in if that's okay. Do we have some more? Yeah, let me look back at my list. <laughs> um, Jenna Dorner asks, can you talk about important salmon habitat restoration projects that are ready to be completed but are being delayed by a lack of funding? Are there um, ready, to, ready to help rivers and habitats that don't have funding? Lots and lots and lots. We have four-year work plans in each one of our watersheds in the state of Washington with four years out of projects that could be funded. So there are hundreds of millions of dollars worth of projects that are waiting for the funds to be implemented right now today. And I think there was an earlier question about, well, what can folks do to help influence that? Well, as we sit here now, the budget's being discussed and negotiated and the, the, the bounds are set, but there's still some choices to be made. And so folks could read out, reach out to their elected officials in their districts. You could call 1-800-562-3000, legislative hotline, and leave a message and say, salmon recovery is important, fund these projects, get it done for us. The orcas need it and we need it. We know that by heart, that I number. Do. do we have another question? Riley Fee, what recommendations did the Puget Sound Partnership make related to seal and sea lion reduction? The, I don't think the Puget Sound Partnership made a recommendation on Maybe the task force the, he the means? The orca task force. Yeah. I think recommended the creation of a, a another task a force? blue ribbon panel to look at the issue. I <laughs> yeah. believe that was their recommendation. Yeah, there, there's been there's been a, uh, quite a bit of research done on that recently. I, uh, um, Allison mentioned the Chasco paper, but we need to put that together and to come up with some specific recommendations that are based on the best available science for what to do about predation. It is it is an issue. Um, it's a challenging issue because of the emotional. Um, concerns about about doing something to another marine mammal in order to protect a marine mammal, uh, but we're not going to be successful at this if we don't figure this out. So, so hopefully that will be funded uh, in this legislative session. There is a package of of actions related to um, improving hatchery production, uh, addressing predators, uh, and other other things at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. We hope that gets funded. And, and we need to give a shout out to Riley. Hey, Riley, how's it going? <laughs> No more questions? Okay. Well, I, you know, we're close to being done, so maybe the best thing to do, I really wanted to help people um, take away something that they can do today, tomorrow. Um, so maybe if you all could just pass the mic, what's the one last thing you want people to hear from you, and what is one thing they can do to help the Southern Resident Killer Whales? And we want to start down here and then just... Um, so if you're really interested in recovering salmon, uh, my recommendation is um, actually we made a sim of it. We made a simulation on tidal exchange called Fishery Reco Recoveries for Dummies. Go check it out and try and you'll see using the math that the fisheries biologists use that this really comes down to recovering some habitat. And if we don't do that, uh, we're going to fail. So that would be my recommendation. Um, I'm going to back David's recommendation. Call, call your legislator and ask them to support additional funding for salmon recovery all of that and everybody lives in a watershed. Get engaged, get involved, do something. I'll make it a little simpler. Call Governor Inslee's office and tell him to put the pressure on the Corps of Engineers in Bonneville to breach these dams starting this year because that's the only solution that's gonna save the Southern residents. I agree with what everybody else has said. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask the other guy to clean up his fishing. Clean up your own fishing. <laughs> Uh, elect environmentally um, progressive uh, people that can help pass laws. 
and help those in office at the city level, at the county level, understand that day-to-day, -day, seemingly unimportant land use decisions, they all add up. Then the cumulative effect of all of those decisions has as much impact as the Snake River dams or as the dam on the North Fork that, and I don't know that a lot of folks at city council, county commission level understand that. And, and we have to get our arms around that cumulative impact of thousands of small decisions. Well, and I'll add something. As someone who tries to get information out there, get informed. Try to figure out everything that you know, you're know you interested in that you might want to get involved in and do your research. There's a lot out there that's available, um, and we can't uh, encourage you enough to uh, be knowledgeable on these topics so that you know how to act purposefully. Um, I never introduced myself. I'm Allison Morrow. I'm the environmental reporter here at King 5. We're going to be doing these panels every night for the next three Wednesdays. This is our first one focused on salmon. Next week, we're going to be focusing on pollution and contaminants and the week after that on boat noise so we hope you will join us back on Wednesday nights from 730 to 830. I've got to say you guys thank you so much for driving thank here you. and being here tonight and for offering all of your thoughts and everyone behave themselves and I'm just so proud of everybody so <laughs> thank you I hope you all got something out of this we'll see you next week.